Hi guys, this is Doug with Fellowship of the Martyrs.com, coming to you from Liberty, Missouri again, uh, out here in the food pantry at the Ministry House, where we've got uh, a place for folks to come and um, stay if they need it, get help. Um, <clears throat> I guess the title of this video is What's Wrong with Paul Washer? More specifically, a particular sermon that he preached about the ten indictments of the modern church that has been called a historical message for the 20th, 21st century church and lauded as a, a summary of what's really wrong and I'm just sure it's not. Now, you could say, well, who's this guy to pick at Paul Washer? Well, who's Paul Washer to think he knows all the answers about what's wrong with the church? How exactly is, are he and I different? Does, is he the only one that hears the Holy Spirit? Does, is he the Pope? He's a guy with a missionary sending agency and, and ministries to people in need. Well, I'm a guy with a missionary sending agency ministering to people in need. He got a way bigger budget than we do? Yo, oh, I'm sure he does. I'm sure he does that. And yet, Joel Osteen has a bigger budget than the both of us, and we're all sure he's whacked. So, uh, I, I'm sorry, Joel, you just are. That, that's just all there is to it. You need to say you're sorry because you're not preaching the gospel. <clears throat> anyway, so, I think I'm entitled to my opinion and I think I can back up my opinion and I think that, I think that I'm hearing God better on this. I think that there's still some denominational baggage and, and I think that there's a lack of a, a, a real understanding of what the big picture, what the big picture is. There's some of his ten indictments. Yeah, I'll give you. That's real, and that's a big deal, and that's a real problem. Some of them, they're not even close to the root core of the problem. Um, they are treating symptoms. They are putting band-aids. They are putting a coat of stucco on a building that's on the wrong foundation in the first place. So, if, if you're supposed to be built over here, on the solid rock of Christ and the, rock, the proper model of church and you're built over here on shifting sand even though it's a nice building and maybe it is leaning a little and maybe there are some holes in it and there's some problems and stuff yet repairing this one is never going to make it supernaturally magically show up over here on the proper foundation it's just not and when we go to critiquing what's wrong with Sunday school um, we are automatically putting band-aids on what is a fundamentally flawed, unbiblical, God-grieving system. So I, I think that I think that uh, you know we're going to have to we're going to have to dig a little bit deeper, because even if the church did all of the things that he's recommending that they do in the ten indictments of the modern church, if 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 the, the institutional church system really took that message to heart and changed all of the things that he's saying to change. I don't think it's fundamentally going to make any real difference. I don't think it's really going to bring revival and it's really going to fix anything. Because I don't think those, the great revivalists in history, when they came with a message that, of things needing to change, I, I, don't think, I don't think those ten were the things that uh, fundamentally were at the root of, of what needed to change. So, but you be the judge. You take it to the Lord and, and, and you decide. And Paul, if you're watching this, Man, I love you. God bless you. I know that your heart is after the Lord. I know that you're my brother. I know that you're one of His. That doesn't mean you're right. And, th and that doesn't mean I have to agree with you. And I'd love to hear from you. I'd love to sit and talk to you. I I'd love to work this out, hash it out, and, and talk it through. Because um, I love you. But this is shallow. And it is not at the root of what's really the problem. Now, I could be wrong, but somebody's going to have to show me biblically where I'm wrong. Because I'm pretty sure I'm hearing this, and I'm pretty sure my experience um, bears witness with, with, with what I'm about to say. So, let me first just run through. Um, you, can, you can find his sermon all over, Sermon Index, and... and uh, whatever, uh, The Ten Indictments of the Modern Church by Paul Washer. I'm sure it's on uh, YouTube too in like ten parts or something. And it's a pretty long sermon and uh, 
I'm going to have to try to summarize his and then give you, excuse me, got itchy. Summarize his and then give you what it is, you know, my indictments of the modern church system in comparison. <laughs> excuse me. Um, here's his ten indictments. Number one, the practical denial of the ins of the sufficiency of Scripture as a guide for all life. So, I'm out here in the dusty garage, so I may just sneeze a couple times here, but uh, bear with me. Um, by by this, he means that uh, we don't see the the Bible as a, as sufficient to guide our lives. We're looking to science or psychology or something else to give us some insight on how to run things in our life when we should just be looking to uh, the Bible. Um, number two, an ignorance of God. And by this he's mainly talking about uh, the justice of God and the righteousness, the holiness, the sovereignty of God, the bigness of God, and how you know scary fear of the Lord kind of thing. Um, number three, a failure to address man's malady, um, which means we don't preach about sin enough and we don't really um, show them how big a trouble they're in. Uh, of course, that true enough that, that that it's not that these aren't true it's not that this isn't a real problem and that these things aren't really happening my what I'm saying is these are symptomology not causal these don't get to the root of what the problem is uh, fixing these would be band-aids on an on a uh, it's like setting a broken leg on a guy with a bleeding sucking chest wound Number four, ignorance of the gospel of Jesus Christ, particularly the doctrine of regeneration and the need to stop sinning and to be different and that salvation, to be truly saved, means you're going to change. Um, again, true enough. No argument. We're not talking about that like we should. Number five, an unbiblical gospel invitation, meaning the sinner's prayer, come down the aisle, repeat after me, and you're all good, you're saved from now on, once saved, always saved kind of a problem that he has a big issue with and kind of sees as his number one threat. Uh, that is killing people left and right. Again, no argument for me. That makes my list too. That's a big one. Number six, ignorance regarding the nature of the church. Um, here, he gets real passionate about uh, those people who poke at the bride at the church and say that it's flawed and broken and whatever need to think twice about insulting the bride of Jesus. Um, then he talks about the local church. And he mixes and matches um, the terminology here. He talks about the universal bride, the true church, the true bride, um, that we shouldn't be poking at her, but then he says that we shouldn't be taking pot shots at the institutional church system, um, which is the true bride, which isn't the true bride. The Southern Baptist Convention is not the bride. Uh, the Methodists, the Presbyterians, the denominational structures are not the true bride. The local institutional congregation church building is with the steeple on top is not the true bride. The true bride is spiritual and eternal, and she's fine. She, she's little right now, and I agree with him. Uh, she's gasping for air in some ways and having a really hard time and working real hard just to survive, but she's fine. And when I talk about what's wrong with the church, I'm not talking about the bride. I'm talking about this thing that we call church, which is not really the church at all, but claims to be the church, which is dead in its sins and in big trouble. But he mixes and matches his language and talks about we need to support the local church, except the local church, by that he means the local building with a pastor, presumably Baptist or at least, you know, something along those lines, and uh, not the entirety of the body of Christ uh, in a city, which is the biblical model, which we'll get to here in a minute. Number seven, he says, uh, one of the indictments of the modern church is a lack of loving and compassionate church discipline. And then he talks about how he goes to a church and he's the member of a church um, that does practice uh, church discipline. The problem is, that's not a church. And there's nowhere in the Bible that it says you're to be a member of a subset of the body of Christ in a city and stay with those guys and ignore the rest of the, of the church in your city. So... Yes, uh, loving discipline, uh, compassionate church discipline is important, but this is a fundamental misunderstanding of what the church is, so it's never going to work no matter how you do it. it, it anyway, uh, when, when, when you were put out of the church in the New Testament era, in the first century, no Christian in town would help you or fellowship with you or be a part with you or, or nothing. You had nowhere to go. If you wanted to fellowship with somebody, you had to move to another town. 
And if the word got to that other town that you had been disfellowshipped from the body of Christ in that town, then they're not going to receive you either. That is discipline. Here, if we have church discipline and we say, no, I'm sorry, we, you're living with your girlfriend, we can't have you here anymore, they're just going to go to the church across the street and be accepted just fine. There's no discipline. There's, there's, no, uh, there's, there's no rod. There's no threat. Because they'll just go pick one of the other 50 or 100 or 1,000 congregations in town and go there because they can find some church, which isn't the church, that will be glad to welcome them no matter what. Uh, whatever. Anyway, so again, it's not that there's not a lack of loving compassion in church discipline. There is a lack of loving compassion in church discipline. It's that the, the definition of church is wrong. Therefore, what it is he's proposing can't possibly work because it's, 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 it's proposing a change to a model that's fundamentally flawed in the first place. Number eight, a silence on separation. That is whole, separation from the world and holiness and the need to be separate. No problem with that one. Absolutely, I'm, I'm giving him that one. Number nine, psychology and so, so, sociology have replaced scripture with regard to family. He talks here about about youth groups all being together and, and the need for gener the, the generation gap and all this stuff talking about the kids are with the kids, the youth are with the youth, the grown-ups, the men are over here, the women are over there, th that we shouldn't be doing that. The families need to be, be together. You shouldn't be. And, and yeah, absolutely, that's, that's all true. And yet, you're complaining about a system that, that is in, in inherently a part of a group of people meeting in a building on Sunday morning. If you were worshiping daily and from house to house, that wouldn't be happening at all. That wouldn't be an issue at all. And even if you fix that, if you eliminate youth groups and Sunday schools and the families all worshiping together, you still haven't fixed the fundamental problem that you are a fact, a, fa a faction, that you are a sect, that you are a division of the body of Christ and that you cannot bring revival to a city all on your own because you refuse to fellowship with the other parts of the body of Christ in your city. Are you with me here? Number 10 is a little fuzzy because even in the transcript, he doesn't specifically say number 10 is this and this and this. I think it's something about uh, putting your ministry above your family, but then it's also something about being a sharp sword and, and it, it's kind of fuzzy right in there. Um, so we're just going to leave that one off. And uh, I know he was running out of time and I think, uh, you know, uh, pardon me if my... Uh, exegesis of his sermon isn't uh, sufficient enough for you but <clears throat> uh, I don't want to fall into the trap of uh, uh, Luther and, uh, uh, Calvin and Arminius going back and forth well he's got five points and I disagree with him so here's my five points well there might have been six or seven but uh, that would have more completely explained everything but he had to have five because Arminius had five and I'm, I don't want to play that game so I got however many it's going to take here 13 or 14 or whatever. Um, and I might not have them in the right order. I know that some of these, he, like number five, uh, the sinner's prayer, he felt real passionate about and maybe should have been higher up on the list, but it doesn't make any difference. So uh, I try to put these in order as best I can, but uh, and, and, and maybe we'll get a transcript of this where uh, people can read it and it'll be valuable to somebody, but uh, for whatever purposes, I don't know if anybody will think this, uh, this is a historic message to the 21st century church and whatever, but I, uh, I believe um, these are going to more fundamentally change things if they were received and implemented than the 10 indictments that, that Paul Washer gave. Uh, first and foremost, we need to have an understanding that iniquity has been multiplied, the love of many has grown cold, and many have been led astray. First and foremost, we need to see that this is the hour we are in. That these are the last days. That many have come uh, claiming to be Jesus. That, that he says that they will be lovers of themselves. Uh, disrespectful. All of those things. All of those verses. Yeah, this is it. We're here. This is the great falling away. We are fallen. Without an understanding of that, you're, you have some optimistic hope that somehow we're going to put a band-aid on what it is that we've built. Instead of understanding that what it is that we've built is fallen, irretrievably, hopelessly broken, flawed, grieving God, covered in the blood of billions. So the first thing is, you've got to have an appreciation and realization for the, re for the, the reality of the hour. 
for the urgency of the times, for the, the situation that we're fully in. Number two, an understanding of the true nature of the scope of the delusion of the hour. Okay? The church of, I've heard I don't know how many pastors talk about the church of Laodicea. That the church of America is the sleepy, lukewarm church of Laodicea. That is blind, wretched, naked, and poor, but thinks they're rich and have need of nothing. Everybody says, oh yeah, we are, we are in the Laodicean age. We are the church of Laodicea. Do you understand that they were under a delusion? That they, they sincerely, with all their hearts, believed they were fine. That they were rich and had need of nothing. We are the point of the spear. We are the model of churchianity, of Christianity. We are what it's supposed to be. Look at us. The American church has the right to direct your past, to show you how to do missions, to show you how to do evangelism, because we, we are as good as it gets. We are God's land. We are the promised land. We are everything. And we are not blind, rich, and naked and poor. We are rich and we have need of nothing. We are the teachers of the world. That is a delusion. A delusion. And it's from God. Deuteronomy 28 said, Because you did not carefully obey the Lord your God with a cheerful heart in times of prosperity, so He will turn you over to your enemies and put blindness and madness on you. That this is the great sign and wonder to you and your generations forever. That He did this to you Himself. Because you refuse to cheerfully obey the Lord your God and carefully follow His commands in times of prosperity. The book that I wrote called The Red Dragon talks about the promise from God that He will put you under a strong delusion and you will go your own way and you will chase the kings that you set over you and your purse will have holes in it and your children will be taken from you and every bad thing will happen to you and in the morning you'll say if only it were evening and in the evening if only it were morning and you'll look to any program, any structure, any new thing, any fad, any marketing strategy that might work to make your situation better because the sheep and the cattle mill around looking for green pasture and they can't find any. And that's a picture of the church in America. There's transfer growth one from another looking for a better music program, better child care, uh, something that will tickle my ears more. Something will get out on time so I can go to lunch. But there's no real growth. And we are eating our own children. We are devouring. We are powering this system with the money and the legs and the energy and the volunteers. Using them up, spitting them out and recruiting new ones. And a million people a year, according to George Barnett, are leaving the Church of America and dropping out. And having home fellowships or just playing golf. The curses of Deuteronomy 28 have fallen upon us. And we are under a delusion. If we think that this that we have built is working, we open a new denomination every other day. We have over 40,000 denominations. And even if you say, oh no, my church is non-denominational. No, that just means you're your own denomination with your own distinctives. You're a denomination of one. But still, you disagree with the pastor, they'll toss your butt out. And be absolutely justified in doing it and think that they're doing God a favor. Defending the faith. Until you understand the true nature and the scope, the size, the scale, the badness of the delusion that we're under, there's no hope. There's no hope of real revival. Nothing is going to change. Until you get a glimpse through the eyes of Jesus and see how bad things are, how really, truly fallen we already are, you're not going to get it. Number three, a fundamental, a fundamental lack of fear of the Lord. I suppose that's what Paul sort of means by an ignorance of God. One time I was sitting around talking to the Lord. And you're welcome to not believe me. I don't really, I don't really care. I was sitting around talking to the Lord. <clears throat> and I said, Lord, uh, they, they don't, there's not enough fear of the Lord in this country. He's like, tell me about it. I said, Lord, in, in the age of computers and the hair club for men, I don't think they're impressed that you know every hair on their, on their head. 
What can I tell them that will show them how big you are? He says, you know quarks? I'm like, well, yeah, you know I know quarks. Quarks are itty bitty little teeny weeny thing. Looks like a rainbow. Smaller, smaller than subatomic particles. Passing through us millions, billions, trillions of them all the time. All over the universe. You know, smaller than electrons, neutrons, protons. Smaller than the atom. Itty bitty little teeny weeny thing. Yeah, I know quarks. He says every quark in the universe has a personal name. Not a serial number, a name. And I named it. And I know where it started and where it's going to end and everything it's going to bump into in between. Is that big enough for you? And my head started swimming. And, and I started to see that not just the quarks, but every construct, every atom, every electron, every leaf, every snowflake. And I'm like, so like, Snowflake Bob? Yeah. Skin Cell Irma? Yeah. Wow. That's a big God. That is who you're spitting in the eye of. That is who you think you're helping with your little marketing studies and your little demographic studies and, and your billboards. That is the God that you're supposed to hit your face, cry like a baby and say, yes, Lord, do whatever you want with me. From now on, you're big and I'm little. But we don't. We treat him like a lifeguard. Put him on a shelf, pull him off when a kid is sick in the hospital. Lord, please rub that lamp. Please, Lord, please come. Please fix this. Like a genie in a bottle. And he's not. He is real big. And he will snatch you up. Justice is a fearsome thing. And we're trying to please man and make friends. And we grieve God. And yeah, there's not enough fear of the Lord. And there's a fundamental cowardice, even among the leaders. I don't know how many pastors I've talked to. How many people I've dared them, dared them, come with a Bible and show me I'm wrong. Show me where the Bible says denominations are okay. And the pastor looked at me and says, you're absolutely right. No pastor in town will take you up on that. No pastor in town can defend denominationalism. They know it's wrong. Okay, buddy, what are you going to do about it? Are you going to change? No, I don't feel like it's my call to help you. <laughs> you freaking coward. You useless freaking coward. You know it's wrong, and you continue in it. Had an Assembly of God pastor say to me, you know, I don't believe in that whole pre-trib rapture thing, but don't tell anybody because they'll decertify me and kick me out of the kick me out of the convention. So we just ignore it all together. I don't want to I don't want to tell my people it's real, so we just ignore it all together. We don't talk about it so that I won't lose my license and certification and 501c3 and whatever to be able to use their name. You coward. You coward. You do not fear God. You fear man. You fear loss of money. You fear loss of people. You fear all kinds of things except God. God Almighty. And you are not in the truth. You know that things are wrong with your denomination. And you will not leave. Why? Because I like it here. Because I'm comfy here. Because my life is here. Because I've invested in this thing. You coward. Repent. Say you're sorry and get out. Or confront them and change it and take a stand. Nail your thesis to the door and say this far and no farther. The Nazarenes are wrong to forbid tongues. It says right there not to, not to do it. The Baptists are wrong to deny the, spirit, the, the gifts of the Spirit. Pick one and take a stand. Maybe you're 16 years old. Maybe you're 18. Maybe you're a pastor and you've been in it your whole life. I don't care. Take a stand. Stop being a coward. Show that you fear God more than you fear man. Number four. Ignorance regarding the true nature of the church. And this touches on some of what I said before. When I sit down with a the pastor, they agree. And yet their language and everything disagrees with what the true nature of the church is. They insist that their building that says church on it 
is a church. And yet, biblically, it cannot be. It just cannot be. It is not, and it cannot be. The only thing in the Bible is the universal church, the, the bride, the whole of everyone that's ever been written in the book of life, the, whether they lived a thousand years ago or today. There is the universal bride, and there is the local church. And the local church is the city church. There is no subdivision allowable smaller than the city church. The body of Christ in one city is the church. And the church is those who are called out that live in a particular place. That's it. Church of Laodicea, Church of Smyrna, Church of Jerusalem, Church of Antioch, Church of Laodicea. That's it. That's it. You don't get to slice that up. Within a city, if you say, I'm for Paul, I'm for Cephas, I'm for Paulus, I'm for Christ, no. You are carnal. You are not spiritual. You are carnal. 1 Corinthians 3. If you say, I'm for Calvin, I'm for Luther, I'm for Saturday, not Sunday. No, you are carnal. You refuse to acknowledge that there are others that have Christ in them that may disagree with you on something secondary, and yet you use a secondary issue, a useless quarrel, to divide the body and not live at peace. And you are in sin, and you are a heretic. Plain and simple, heresy means school of opinion. If you look at it, you are a part of a school of opinion. If you insist that nobody can play with me unless they agree with me. Now, until we build on the proper foundation, which is one body per city, under his headship, if you've got Jesus and I've got Jesus, then we're one and we need to figure out how to get along without killing each other. What do you need? If I got it, you can have it. I don't care where you are on Sunday morning. We're one. I can see Jesus in you and we're one. Until you build on that foundation, which is the foundation of Christ, which is the last prayer he prayed before the cross, that we would be one like he and the Father is one, you cannot build a proper temple. You cannot build on the living stones are over here in their little boxes, fighting over their little stupid stuff, separated all over town, unwilling to be one. And those living stones cannot come together and build the temple that Christ had in mind, not built by human hands because it's under His headship and He's the capstone because you're on the wrong foundation. Because the foundation is the city church. One body per city under Christ's headship. Not under Nashville's headship. Not under Church of Christ, you know, Anderson's headship but on, under Christ. One body per city. Self-directed, autonomous, independent, not under some pope, not under some super apostle. Nobody gets to tell the Church of Liberty what to do. The Church of Liberty hears God and the Church of Liberty obeys God and is built on that foundation. Now, even if there are people in Liberty that have Christ in them that don't want to be a part of the Church of Liberty, it doesn't make a difference. They are part of the Church of Liberty, whether they want to be or not, because if they got Christ in them, they're part of those who are called out that live in Liberty. Whether they like me, whether they want to play nice with me, makes no difference. They're part of the Church of Liberty. And I need to understand that and love them back, whether they love me or not. Because we're one. And whether they want to obey or not, it doesn't matter. I have to obey, because I want to be under His headship, and I'm part of the Church of Liberty. And the more that catches on, and the more people start to get it, the more they go, wow, you know, yeah, I don't know why we have 50 congregations in one little 28,000 person town. How did it get this bad? Well, it got this bad because we paid people to go to seminary to learn why they're smarter than the guys at the other seminary. We paid them to be factious. We paid them to come back from seminary and teach us why we're better Christians than the people in that building over there. Why we're more right, more pure, more true, and that's a delusion because we are all grasshoppers. We are all like the sands as far as the, the sky is above the sands, so is God above us. We cannot understand his ways. We will not understand his ways and no doctrine or theology or whatever that you put together will work. Except he's big, you're little, shut up, do whatever he tells you. And he's going to tell you to love each other and have faith like a child. Not faith like a belligerent teenager that went to seminary and thinks he knows everything. Until you understand what the church really is, the true nature of what the local church is, you're building on the wrong foundation. A revival at, at the corner of, 
of, of Maine and Broadway at First Baptist Church. May, there may be some people in there awakened. There may be some people saved. But it's not going to wreck the town. It's not going to close the bars. You know, in the, in, the, in the days of the Great Awakenings, with Finney and Mariah Woodworth Etter and, and Wesley and Whitfield and those guys, the Salvation Army, it wrecked the town. Mariah Woodworth Etter preached in a little town in Kansas. They said after six weeks of preaching out in an open field, repenting and people crying and whatever, the hand of God was so strong on that town, you could not curse inside city limits anymore. Okay, I want that. Why aren't we seeing that? Because we're factious and divisive and denominational and we're trying to put a band-aid on what is fundamentally the wrong model in the first place. Number five. A lack of understanding about what happened to our lampstands. In Revelation 2 and 3, he starts off right away with the church of Ephesus and says, you've lost your first love, and if you don't get it back, I'm going to take your lampstand from its place. Okay, well that... If Jesus is going to threaten them with taking away their lampstand, that sounds like a really bad thing, doesn't it? I mean, why would he threaten them with something that wasn't bad? And what is it they did exactly? How do you lose your first love? Well, the great two commandments are love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind and all your strength and love your neighbor as yourself. Well, if you stop loving your neighbor as yourself, you must have already broken the first one. And if, if you're not loving God, you can't love your neighbor. So they're 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 in the, they're they're connected. You that you can't separate those two. And he says, in the last days, the love of many will grow cold. Love for what? Love for God? Yes. Because if you love God, you love your neighbor. Love for your neighbor? Yes. Because if you were loving your neighbor, it would be because you love God. Four years ago, the Lord showed me a vision of complete blackness over America. Complete blackness. Months later, I start talking to him about what is the church? How is it supposed to work? Everybody's lying to me. Who do I trust? I want to listen. To, I want to hear it from you. And he talks to me about the lampstands. And he talks to me about the church of Ephesus in Revelation 2. And, and he says, what do you think would happen if I took away your lampstand? I, I don't know. He says, does that mean there's no more Christians in Ephesus? No. Paul was there. I mean, I mean other people were there. And, does that mean that I'm going to take the Holy Spirit out of the Christians in Ephesus? No, you said you'd never take your spirit from us. I don't get it. What does it mean, Lord? It means they don't get my nuclear weapon, my stamp of approval, the firepower that comes when the star of the city blows on that fire. That that When you lose your first love, what should be a bonfire in the middle of town, burning brightly with humongous power, the, the darkness whispers and one of the little flames goes over here to see what's out, what's out there. And maybe two or three come over here and they got a little fire going and five or six got a little fire going over here. And maybe, maybe you have a thousand or ten thousand in one place and you got quite a little flame going, but it's nothing like it would be if everybody was in the same bonfire in the middle of town and God was blowing on it and blessing it. That's when bars close and prostitutes repent and the prisons close and, and the hand of God is so strong nobody can curse inside city limits anymore and things change. In, in Hernhut, Germany, the Holy Spirit showed up when they came together and repented and, they, and, and, and the result was a 100 year 24-7 prayer meeting. That is a lampstand. That is the fire of God changing things. In Fiji, they repented and, and poison rivers ran clean and barren women had babies and the ecology changed. And that is a lampstand. Why do we have so few instances in the world, in history, in revival history of real true lampstands and the fire of God, pillar of fire coming down on a place because of the division, faction, dissension, selfish ambition, envy, lust, pride, greed that will keep you from inheriting the kingdom of God. Galatians 5, 19-21. When you are one and you have faith like a child, the fire of God will show up and it will move things and change things and wreck things. But four years ago, the Lord showed me a picture of complete blackness. And I said, Lord, are there any lampstands in America? He said, no. There is no city under my headship. There is no place where they are committed to my will and my will only and being one with all the rest of the body. Well, that's bad, right? Yeah, that's really bad. Well, what do we do? 
you need to light the lampstands. Well, how do we light all the lampstands? You don't have to light all of them. Just get a fire burning in your own backyard. Just like Gideon. Him and ten friends, under cover of darkness, before they went out against the Midianites and conquered the, the, the Midianites that were oppressing the land like locusts, he said, before I can give you victory against the world, you got to get the altar of Baal out of your own backyard. And him and ten friends, under cover of darkness, they go and they knock down the altar of Baal and build it again with undressed stones. They didn't try to shape them and mold them and make them look the way they wanted. They just piled the stones up the way God shaped them with the wind and the river. And they cut down the Asherah poles, which is a big fertility symbol, which is essentially a steeple to say, look at me, look how godly I am. They cut the Asherah poles down and burned them in the fire and took Dad's second best bull and burned it. And everybody wakes up in the morning, hey, where's our altar of Baal? Who did this? Well, Gideon. Let's kill Gideon. And Gideon's dad says, come on, guys, leave him alone. Let Baal fight his own battles. And they leave, and they leave him alone because they know you know, the kid might be right. We probably should have an altar to Yahweh. We, we probably ought not to have an altar of Baal. And they leave him alone, and God protects him. And then God gives him victory with 300 guys over the Midianites. Not a guy lost, and they live at peace with God. And all the altar of Baals get destroyed in, in the land, and they live at peace with God because of that one that was so powerful. When it was set right, with undressed stones, unshaped, unmolded, made the way God made them, fitted together by His hand. Anyway, you can ask the Lord, but what I heard four years ago is that there was no lampstands in America. There was no city under His headship. And we prayed and we cried and we begged and we pleaded and we asked the Lord, asked the Lord to do whatever He had to do to light the lampstand in liberty. In October 31st, 2005, I believe He did. He said he was going to. Lots of people received a word that a fire was going to start burning in the heartland. That a cloud was going to rise up in the Midwest and spread to the north and the south and the east and the west. That it would bring revival. And they believed uh, Chuck Pierce was on the Elijah list. Chuck Pierce had this vision. That a cloud was going to show up. That it was going to kill the crops. It was going to bring economic devastation. And that was going to bring revival and whatever. It didn't manifest at all the way he said it would at all. Of course, he didn't repent for it or say he was wrong or anything. But something did happen. And I believe the lampstand in Liberty, Missouri got lit. And after that, it began to spread to the south and the north and the east and the west. And there's little fires burning, sometimes held aloft by one or two people, absolutely committed to Christ's headship and to be in unity with everybody, whether they're in unity back with them or not. And the good news is it's coming. But they're few and they're little. And they need help. You ask the Lord if there's a lampstand, if there's a candlestick burning brightly in your city. And I'm not talking about a local congregation or a local ministry. I'm talking about the body of Christ being one under His headship. Why does nobody talk about this? Why does nobody understand or preach about what Jesus means by this lampstand? Why are these important? And what happens if it gets taken away? And how do we get it back if it did get taken away? Isn't it just like Satan to want to hide that? To want to not talk about that? If it's so important that Jesus would threaten them with taking it away, isn't it something we should investigate and talk about? And yet I've never heard a sermon about it except the sermons the Lord's preached to me. Number six, a lack of understanding and awareness of God's government. First of all, Romans 13 is not about civil governments. Romans 13 does not say that we must obey every civil government because it's set in place by God and to resist the power means heaping damnation on our heads. That cannot be. People say God would never tell you to speed. Oh yeah, why? Because God commands us to obey the government because it's set in place by God. Okay, which government? The Nazi government? Hitler? Didn't we resist Hitler? But if he's set in place by God, aren't we resisting the power that's set in place by God and heaping damnation on ourselves? How is it we smuggle Bibles into China and Russia? How is it we start illegal house churches in China? 
How is it we preach the gospel in Saudi Arabia and smuggle in Bibles if we're resisting the order, the civil government that's set in place by God and by so doing we're heaping damnation on ourselves? Are you telling me Richard Wormbrandt and Brother Andrew and Brother Yun and all these people are actually going straight to hell because they did something the government told them not to do? That cannot be. And people say, oh, well, no, you, we, we're to obey the government until such a point as it disagrees with the laws of God. No, that's not what the Bible says at all. That's not what Romans 13 says at all. If that's about civil governments, there's no out clause. There is no, there is no right to impeach a president you disagree with. There's no right to even vote against him. Because if you do so, you are, you are going against God and you are heaping damnation on yourself. It cannot be about civil governments. It cannot be. Well, then what's it about? It's about God's government. It's about the five-fold ministry that God sets in place. It's about the, the, the understanding who the Lord has set over you, not to boss you around, not to rule over you, not to tell you what to do, but the elders that the Lord has shown you, has set in place to teach you and to grow you and to serve you. You have to understand who those are, and accurately so, and you cannot take man's word for it. And you cannot, you cannot listen to someone that says, I'm an apostle, because it says right here on my business card, I'm an apostle. And ten other guys that say apostle on their business card determined I was an apostle and anointed me and gave me a piece of paper that says I'm an apostle, so I'm an apostle and you have to obey me. That is not God's government. Somebody that tells you who they are and puts it on their business card probably isn't. Or they're immature enough that they don't understand the danger of saying such a thing and uh, probably shouldn't be listened to anyway. Whatever I am should be obvious by what I do without me having to say anything. If you can't just ask God who I am and He'll tell you, then you probably don't need to know and I'm not going to tell you. But it's really important that we begin to understand who the elders are because whoever has the biggest cup of Jesus in the room is the elder. Whoever's hearing Him the best at that moment is the elder. And if the pastor of your congregation gets up front and talks about himself and his kids and his lawn every Sunday, and it's just all jezebel -y, fleshy stuff, then odds are pretty good that if you want to get healed and you're supposed to call the elders and they're supposed to lay hands on you and you call him, you're not going to get healed. Because he's not the elder. The elder might be the little old lady in the back that hears God real good and everything in heaven stops when she prays. I want her to pray for me. Or the elder might not even be somebody in your congregation at all because the elders are part of the city church, not part of your little congregation. So you might not get healed at all because you refuse to understand who the elders are in your city. And the elders are probably the ones feeding the hungry, clothing the naked, taking in the poor wanderer, holding the heads of the junkies, doing deliverance, breaking the yokes of oppression, just like Isaiah 58 says. If you want to hear God better, find one of those guys and ask them how they hear God. And ask them to help you hear God better. But the denominational, factious, seminarian up front may not be an elder at all. Now they could be. I've met some that are. But there's no guarantee that because they have a piece of paper, they have the biggest cup of Jesus and are the most cleaned out. Surveys say 50% of pastors in America are addicted to pornography. Okay, that's a big open doorway. He may not be cleaned out. You might need to find a little old lady in the back in the wheelchair because she suffered and she knows God and she hears God. Might be a kid in the youth group. Might be that... It might be that kid with purple hair that you just aborted out of there. He's the one that Jesus showed up to in person, in the bathroom, said, you're going to serve me forever. I'm going to use you to bring revival to all of Missouri. And you tossed him out because he didn't have a sweater. But he was the one that could lay hands on you and pray and heal you and had the faith to do it. Never know. But you better get familiar with what God's government is. You better understand who they are. And you better understand how it's supposed to work when he's in charge. And it's about service. The greatest among you will be the one at the end of the table with the apron serving people. Number seven, refusal to hear the voice of God, denial of the gifts, and the inability to test the spirits. In Exodus 20, they're all gathered. All of the children of Israel that have just got out of Egypt, they're all at the bottom of Sinai. Clouds, lightning, everything. The presence of the Lord is up on the mountain and He gives them the Ten Commandments. 
And it's not like in the Charlton Heston movie where he goes up and, and God just talks to Charlton Heston. The Ten Commandments are given to the entire nation and they quake and they are scared. And the elders, elders, say to Moses, we don't want to hear from him anymore. He's too scary. If we hear him again, we will die. You go up the hill and ask him what he wants and we'll listen to you. Okay, well, isn't that just suicide? Aren't they just trying to kill Moses? If hearing God again is going to kill him, aren't they just telling Moses to go up and die? And, and, but here they are, having just got the Ten Commandments. In the garden there was one rule. Don't eat from that. Now he's giving them ten. Ten little rules. Moses, and they, they tell Moses, we don't want to hear from him anymore. He's too scary. You go up. We'll listen to man. We'll listen to man. We don't want to listen to God. We'll listen to man. You go ask him what he wants, and you tell us. We'll listen to you. We'll obey you. But they never do obey Moses. And Moses says to them, he's just trying to test you so that the fear of the Lord will keep you from sinning. He's just trying to speak to you. Because if you heard his voice, he would keep you from sinning. He would put the fear of the Lord in you. They're like, no, he's too scary. We don't want to hear that. We'll die. You go talk to him. So Moses goes up on Sinai, spends 40 days with the Lord. They don't know where he went. They make a golden calf. That's how fast they forgot how scary God was. Because they didn't want to hear God. They wanted to hear man because it's easy to ignore man. But once you start hearing the voice of God, it's hard. You're in big trouble. He, he, he's not going to judge you that much for, for ignoring man. But when you hear his voice and then ignore him, oh, you're in big trouble. Big trouble. Fundamentally, we don't want to hear God. We don't want to learn what it's going to take to hear God. We don't want to test the spirits. We want to believe that any angel that shows up is a good thing and, and we're just going to go along with whatever any white, sh shiny thing tells us without testing the spirits. On the Baptist side, i got pastors. I say, look, I'm just hearing that, that God's coming to liberty and something big's coming. What do you mean you're hearing? Well, God told me. Well, God doesn't talk to people anymore. The Bible's done being written now. Well, God doesn't talk to us. Dude, are you telling me that that which is perfect has come? Because this don't look perfect. I'm going to kill myself if this is what's perfect. Yeah, God doesn't talk to people anymore. Now we have the Bible to guide us. I'm like, okay, so who called you into the ministry? Because it doesn't say Bob should go to seminary in the Bible. Was it just easier than being a plumber? Or was your dad a pastor and you just figured you'd take over the family business? Because it doesn't say in the Bible that you should go into the ministry. So if somebody called you, who was it? Because it seems to me that's the voice of the Lord. And we ought to be hearing and obeying. And then they harumph and walk off mad. But I know. My, dad, my mom and dad were missionaries to Mexico. My mom, when she was 13, heard a call from the Lord to be a missionary in Mexico. And prayed and prayed and prayed. Met a guy in college who was a math major. Everybody says, don't marry him. You'll, you'll be giving up what God told you to do. And she prayed. God called him to the ministry. He became a pastor. She prayed. God called him to go to Mexico. And off they went. She didn't pester. She didn't annoy him. She just prayed. And when God told him to go, off they went. And they heard the voice of God. Why aren't you hearing the voice of God? Maybe because it's easier to listen to man. Because when a guy in a suit gets up on Sunday and says, you need to do this, you need to do this, you need to stop sinning, you need to turn off the TV, great sermon, Pastor. Great sermon. God bless you. Let's go have a beer. We can ignore him easy. But if God invades your head, invades your life, invades your house, it's going to be a lot harder. That's why. That's why the children of Israel didn't want to hear God. Because they knew they would die. That their flesh would die and that they would obey God. And they didn't want that. They liked their flesh and they liked their sin. And they didn't want God messing with it. How about you? How about your congregation? How about your city? Do you really want to hear God no matter what He has to say, even if it hurts real bad? Number eight. Now here, here I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to intersect with Paul on this one. Lack of holiness, a lack of preaching about holiness, a lack of separation from the world. We're supposed to be a peculiar people. We're supposed to be different. We're supposed to be hated by the world and persecuted. We're not supposed to be like them. We're not supposed to like the things they like. We're not supposed to joke the way they joke. We're not supposed to use the language they use. We're supposed to be different. We're supposed to be holy and clean. And if you're not, there's going to be gateways that the enemy can use that will keep you from hearing God and walking in His ways. 
You have to seek regeneration. You have to seek Him changing your nature, filling you with Christ, getting your cup so full of Jesus that none of you can even fit in there anymore, that He's making all the decisions, that He's running your life, and that, and that when you talk, Jesus comes out. Not your flesh, not Satan, not doctrines of Nashville, denominational headquarters, nothing. That Jesus comes out of your mouth. And you pray and you beg and you ask the Lord to crucify all of you, crucify your flesh, cut out your tongue, do whatever He's got to do so that you will be pure and walk in His ways. And He'll answer that and He'll do it. Number nine, a lack of total sacrifice. I don't... I guess this intersects with Paul's one about you have to put family ahead of ministry which I don't think is biblical. Jesus said, if you're going to follow Him, you have to be willing to lose mother, brother, wife, children, lands for the Gospel. He says that it will cost you these things and that He'll replace them. And He even says to the disciples, they say, what about us? And He says, I know that some of you have left behind mother, father, brother, wife, sister, children, and I will not fail to replace it a hundred times in this life and eternity in the age to come. He expects that it could cost you those things. Now, you better be sure that you're chasing God and not your ministry, not what you want to build or what, you th what, what, what seems best unto you. But sometimes they won't walk it with you. It could happen that way. And you don't... I had a, a lady who was really seeking after God and her husband her, just really wasn't. He was busy with career, big exec and whatever and she was growing in the Lord and hearing God better and walking in His ways and, and reading the Bible all the time and she went to her pastor and she said, I just, you know, I don't know what to do because he's not the spiritual head of the family that he should be and I don't know what to do. And the pastor said to her, you need to slow down. You need to stop reading the Bible so much and let him catch up so that he can stay out front. And that's the most insane thing I've ever heard. She is going to stand in judgment by herself before God. Not next to Him. By herself. And have to explain, oh yeah, I slowed down in my pursuit of holiness and righteousness and God so that He could catch up. No, I don't think I don't think that's good advice. Maybe she is the spiritual head. Never mind that he has a penis. She's got a bigger cup of Jesus than him. And he is the husband. See, I think whoever's got the most Jesus is the one wearing the pants. Because if, if, if my wife speaks to me and it's Jesus coming out of her mouth, then I need to say yes, Lord, and hang my head and obey her. But I'm not obeying her. I'm obeying the Jesus in her. And he's wearing the pants and he's my husband. Total sacrifice means, yeah, it could cost you everything. And are you willing? I even heard Paul Washer talk about if his son goes to the mission field and loses his life for the gospel, praise God. Praise God how proud he would be. And, and all kinds of people say, I'm going to I'm gonna go street preach, I'm going to go be a missionary. And if even one life is reached for the gospel, it will be worth it all. And we look at guys like Jim Elliott from Point of the Spear that that fly their plane down into the savage tribe uh, in the Amazon or whatever to preach them the gospel and get killed. And they knew when they left. They said goodbye to their wives and their kids knowing there was a chance that they, couldn't, they might not come back. And we look at them and we call them heroes. And yet they abdicated their responsibility to their family. They, they knew. They put themselves in a dangerous position that would leave their children fatherless and their wife husbandless without support, without whatever, for the gospel. And we call them heroes. We call them martyrs. Total sacrifice means whatever it takes, Lord, whatever it costs. Even if nobody likes me, even if I lose everything I care about, so long as I'm obeying you, so long as I'm walking in your ways, I don't think you can find a biblical prescription that says your family is your first point of ministry. 
There's all kinds of prophets in the Old Testament. That Jesus said, I'm going to kill your wife tonight. And I don't want you to cry about it because it's an object lesson. Oh, come on, Lord. This, this, this kind of stinks. I know, but it's really important and I love you. And it's all part of the big plan. And it's going to bring me glory. So tonight I'm going to kill her. And the love of your life, the apple of your eye, I'm going to kill her. And, you know, um, it's going to be so that Israel can see that I'm not going to cry about it when they die either. <sighs> okay, Lord. Do whatever you want with me. That was Jeremiah. Hosea, he says, go marry a prostitute. Bring her to your home. Adopt her kids. It, this is an object lesson of like what I do with Israel because they're adulterous whore cheating against me having, having babies with other people. Uh, but I'm going to still tr bring them in and love them. And try. And buy them back out of slavery. Okay. His ways are not our ways. You need to be real careful about saying what God will and won't do. Because when he says, when you go down the aisle and you say, you sing, I surrender all, all to Jesus, I surrender, I surrender all. Do you mean everything except my family? Everything except my marriage? I won't, I won't give up my marriage for the gospel. I won't give up my children for the gospel. I'm unwilling to sacrifice that and God wouldn't ask me to. I don't. I don't think. I don't think you can find that in the Bible, and I don't think you can find that in the heroes of the of the gospel, in the pantheon of witnesses that have gone before us. Number ten, an unwillingness to accept dissonance. This is a big one because we are. We have been so programmed to insist that everybody agrees with us. That, that they have to believe what we believe or we can't play nice with them. If you're not a Calvinist, then you're going to hell. If you're not this, if you're not that, if you're not a fundamental, independent, King James only, 1611, whatever, then you're going to hell. Because we can't handle dissonance. In, a, in an orchestra, if you're playing the violin, there might be another instrument right next to you playing a dissonant chord. And they sound out of key with each other. But in the context of the piece of music, it, it's, a, it's a transitional movement that's just beautiful. And the audience gets it, and there's this moment where you're like, oh, oh, oh I get it now. I get where they're going. But especially with jazz and with other stuff, you've got to be able to handle dissonance. You've got to, have to, to be okay with somebody singing in your ear off key and be okay with that and not want to turn around and slap them and tell them to sing the melody line. Because that's what fundamentally we're doing. We're building boxes where we invite people to come sing Jesus Loves Me on the melody line with us. And everybody's got to sing it the same way, same key, same frequency, same pitch, same everything, all together, or else you got to go. And it's not very creative. It's not very interesting. It doesn't express the bigness of God. We've got barns of toes cloning more toes instead of acknowledging that we're a body. And some of you are fingers, and some of you are toes, and the hand can't say to the eye, I don't need you. And, and yeah, some of you are eyeballs, and that's really cool, and some of you are stomach acid. And it's really good if the eyeballs and the stomach acid stay very far apart, because they're not supposed to be right next to each other. But still, you can't toss the stomach acid out. You're going to need it. You will starve to death and die. You understand? There's chemicals in your body that will kill you instantly if they get into the wrong part of your body and yet they're absolutely necessary. We have to be able to get along. We have to come down to faith like a child, to the simplicity of the gospel that says, if Jesus is in you and Jesus is in me, then you're my brother, you're my sister, and that's all there is to it. Now we have to learn how to not devour each other, how to not kill each other. We have to learn how to be one because our Savior, our Messiah, our King, the last prayer He prayed before He went to the cross was that we would be one like He and the Father are one. Do you know how much He and the Father are one? And He wants us to be one with each other like Him and the Father are one? That was His prayer. And we're as far from one as we can get. And part of it is because we refuse to accept dissonance. If I'm a violin... And you're a saxophone or an oboe. I don't get to tell you what to do. I don't know how to play your instrument. I don't know what kind of noise you're supposed to be making or how you're supposed to be making it. I have to trust the conductor 
keep my eyes on Him and believe that He is going to fix you in His time. And in the meantime, I just have to hope and pray that somehow this is going to sound good to the audience that's listening, to the great cloud of witnesses, that they're going to appreciate the music that we're making. But I have to trust that the conductor of this orchestra, this billion part harmony that he's written, that he will get everybody playing their part. And there will be dissonance. There will be and there must be. How are you going to get, you know, I, I, I struggle with this. How, how do we have a revival in the park where all the different parts of the body come together? And I got the Church of Christ that thinks instruments are, are of the devil. And, and I got... Uh, Christian rappers that really believe and are really inspired and really feel like this is the medium that the Lord gave them to, to reach a certain subset of the body of Christ. How do we get along unless our love, our inseparability, our freakish, unstoppable, can't separate us, got to be together, self-sacrificing love is so overwhelmingly powerful that none of those other issues can pull us apart. That's the only thing that's going to work. Love is the thing. Not your tongues, not your prophecies, not your gnosis, not your knowledge, not your theology, not your seminary. It's the love that's the thing. Number 11. <coughs> we have a fundamental problem with the love of the world. With marketing surveys, with the, with the way they do things, with wanting to be a corporate model, with a CEO, pastor, and assistant you know, COO, CFO, assistant pastors, and all of this stuff. We are fundamentally a pyramid, working like the world, doing things the way they do, uh, adopting the marketing models and the, the boutique church systems and the, the demographic studies and focus groups of the world to build, to plant churches. You can't plant a church. Either there is a church there or there's not. If there's anybody in that city that is of Jesus, is in Christ, then there is already a church of that city. You don't need to plant one. You need to get them to be one and act like one and show them by modeling mostly and words if you have to what it means to be one body. It may be your bass boat. It may be your soap operas. It may be your football team. It may be whatever. But you cannot love the things of this world. You cannot look like them. You need to be separate. You need to be different. We need to be otherworldly. People need to look at us and go, that guy doesn't even belong here. Why? Because his mind is in heaven. His heart is in heaven. He hates this place. I pray all the time, Lord, kill me. This nasty mud ball, this cesspool, get, get me out of here. Take me home. No, you're not done yet. Okay, thanks, Lord. <clears throat> Number 12. And I hope I can express this correctly because it is really important. There is a deep and fundamental hatred for the humble things in America. We, we would immediately expel John the Baptist from the pulpit. If somebody showed up, you know, the, the song, Todd, oh shoot, I just blanked. Todd Agnew has a song called My Jesus. Look it up. It talks about, you know, Jesus wouldn't be welcome in my church. The blood and, and the dirt on his feet might stain the carpet. And everybody likes that song and nobody changes. We hate the humble things. We want a guy with a Rolex and a Harley and a jet plane to talk to us because he is successful. He's got money. God's blessing him. He's the guy. He went to seminary. He's, he's got a doctorate. He's got all the credentials that the world believes are important. A guy in camel skin eating locusts and honey? No. Forget him. He's nuts. Jesus, no place to lay his head. Wandering around all the time. Wherever God says, like the wind. No, we don't want that guy. We want a guy that's stable, that's got a family, and a white picket fence, and clearly is better off than we are so he can show us how to be better off. We don't understand affliction. We don't understand suffering. We don't understand somebody like Daniel Nash. You ever hear of Daniel Nash? Google Daniel Nash. 
prevailing prince of prayer. There's an article about him. Charles Finney, you ever hear of Charles Finney? Oh yeah, big revivalist, 100,000 people saved. Yeah, Charles Finney. Do you know that Daniel Nash was his intercessor and went out on the road with him? And it was Daniel Nash's prayers that did the warfare, that opened the doors so that Finney could come into a city and bring revival. And then Nash would move on to the next city. And when he thought it was warmed up enough and whatever praying had been done, he'd be in a, a cellar, fasting without food or water, groaning for days, travailing against the powers over that city, travailing for revival, praying to open the doorways, to crush whatever was in the way. And then Finney would come into town, knock him dead, bring revival, and Nash would move on. When Nash died, Finney didn't go out on the road ever again because he knew he could not do it without Daniel Nash. And Daniel Nash burned his body out and died of pneumonia from all of the times he fasted and cried and, and fell asleep in dirty, wet cellars. Died in his bed with a map of the world praying country by country that the Holy Spirit would fall on the world. Fifty years before Azusa. That guy was humble. I can only find like two articles on the whole internet about this guy. And yet he was more important in my estimation than Finney. Because Finney could not do it without him and knew it. And yet he is the guy we dismiss and overlook. Because he had the humble job. The behind the scenes job. He was an intercessor and a prayer warrior. And he wasn't the guy up front that everybody knew. But Satan knew him. I think it would be better to be that guy. But we don't know who those are. I've been in a congregation eight-year-old autistic kid came up and laid hands on me and prayed for me and all the hair on my arm went up and I knew he was blessing me he was praying for me he was so shiny he had the biggest cup of Jesus in the whole place and, and he was the greeter at the door and remembered everybody's name and just was so glad to see you and was just so much like Christ in that way and I went to the pastor after and I said dude He's got the biggest cup of Jesus in the place. And he said, I know. We know. We take really good care of him. He's special. And not special because he's retarded or autistic or whatever. Special because he loves God. And if he's got something to say in the middle of a sermon, they stop and listen to him. Because they know that the love of Christ is in him in some humongous measure. Praise God for that place. For a pastor with that kind of willingness and foresight. Sensitivity to the Holy Spirit. Which is rare. By and large, we don't respect the humble things. We don't see how God moves. And yet the Word says He uses the humble, the broken and contrite vessels for His purposes. That He uses the humble things to confound the wise. But we insist on being wise and thinking that we can't be confounded by the humble. And yet He's doing it all the time. When I prayed, Lord, I want You to be in charge. Show me what church is supposed to be like. All of a sudden, I'm surrounded by ex-drug dealers, ex-witches, ex-jewel thieves, ex-prostitutes, ex-whatever that the world has tossed out. And God says, these are the big guns. These are the ones that hear me and obey. These are the ones that are transformed. And it brings me more glory to use these than T.D. Jakes and Joyce Meyer and whatever. Be real careful. If I'm right about this, if we have a fundamental hatred, a disrespect, a dislike for the humble things, why? Where did we learn it? And was it from God? Is it consistent with the Bible? Why, why would you rather listen? Why would you rather listen to Paul Washer than me? Why does he have more clout than me? Why does the Pope get more respect than me? Because of the robes? Because of the money? Because of the number of people that listen to them? Is that really... Are, are, those any, are any of those the ways that we're told to judge the fruit? Is the size of your ministry really evidence of the fruit of the Spirit? And yet those are the criteria mostly that we use. Who's got a best-selling book? Who's the most well-known? Uh, but, uh, but I don't think you could biblically justify that that's the way God does things. There's a whole lot of unnamed prophets in the Bible. The unnamed prophet came before Gideon. 
the prophet from Samaria came and spoke about Josiah and prophesied about him. We got a lot of unnamed prophets that did some really hard things. And God was real pleased with them and they were the apple of His eye. And they came to rebuke kings. You need to be real careful. And you need to change the way that you're looking at things. If you, if you have a hatred for the humble things, and you can't see how God moves in the unexpected people, the unlikely vessels. Number 13. I'm going to intersect here again with, with Paul on a complete misunderstanding about how to get saved and stay saved. Either we believe in a once saved, always saved kind of theology or we believe in a sinner's, sinner's prayer. Or on some level we think that we're just elect. And God's going to save who He's going to save and we don't really need to preach to Him because He'll save Him sooner or later. And if He died for you, then you're one of His and that's all there is to it. And we don't need to really disciple you. We don't need to walk in holiness. We don't need to work out our salvation with fear and trembling as if it's an ongoing thing because it's an on-off switch. And I don't believe it's an on-off switch. I believe it's a dial. I believe that your dial gets turned off of zero and clicked on when you accept Him as Lord. But you prove that you meant it when you continue daily to make Him Lord and walk out being a bondservant. See, a bondservant is a slave, and we were slaves to sin, that is freed and then agrees to stay with that master and become a lifelong slave for that master. So, I believe that, 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 that I had free will long enough to say, to, 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 to be freed. And the Lord said, now you're free. What do you want to do? I want to stay with you. You freed me. I love you. I want to stay with you. I'll be a slave to you forever. You know better than me. You've always taken good care of me. I want, I'll, I'll be a bondservant. Okay. Then he pierces your ear. That's it. You're his. You don't get to decide anymore. You don't have any more free will after that. You're a bond servant. You're a slave. You are a voluntary slave with no options, no way out, no hope. You are permanently a bond servant. He agrees not to trade you, not to sell you, not to give you to anybody else. And he's going to keep you and be your master forever because you love him so much and you grew up with his kids and you love his family and you want to be with him. But you don't get a say anymore. If he decides to pick up and move to another city, then you go because he's the boss. He's master, king, commander, and you're a bondservant. If you truly met Lord, Lord, and met, you are in charge of me in every way, every dot, every tittle, every everything, every what to wear, what to eat, where to go, everything, you're in charge of me from now on, then you're saved. If you met, you're a lifeguard, and I said this prayer, and now I'm good, I'm good from now on, I can do whatever I want, and I don't have to obey you anymore, and I don't have to walk in your ways, and I don't have to love you and do what you tell me to do, then you're not saved. You're saved when He says you're saved, and He writes it on your heart. And, he, and, and it could take a long time. There's a video online called The Graham Formula. Do a search. It's a free ebook, and there's a video on our site and other sites called The Graham Formula that talks about how it got, how the once saved, always saved, and the, and the altar call invaded uh, the institutional church and, and has led it off track in so many ways and it is responsible for the death and, and the, the, the ticket to hell of so many millions and maybe billions that think they're safe and they're not. Well that's 13. I didn't want to do 10. I wanted to do the number the Lord wanted me to do. You judge. Take it to the Bible. Take it to the Lord. And ask the Lord if these were obeyed, if these were heeded, and things changed according to these, if the city church was restored, if denominations were set aside, if we were really truly one, if we sought after His voice, and walked in His ways, if we had fear of the Lord, then 
would things be fundamentally, foundationally different? I think, yeah. I think that's when we build with the living stones that we value each because they all have Jesus in them. And you may have some, some gift, some, some skill, some talent that we can't, we can't live without. We really need Freddie's anointed flute playing that, that breaks people, that, that brings healing. We really need the gift of faith from, from Grandma in the wheelchair. And we can't do without it. And we can't marginalize and dismiss her because she doesn't have a seminary degree. She has Jesus in her and she's valuable. And that kid that just walked in with purple hair, we don't know what he's bringing. And we may desperately need that fire in his belly, that, that, that desire for change, that, that heart, that hunger, whatever. We can't toss him out because he might be the missing key to revival in your city. He might be the humble vessel that God's going to use to confound you. And you better be humble enough to be willing to set your pride aside and say, okay, Lord, even if he's the guy you use, just bring it. Just let the fire fall. Do Use whoever. I appreciate you listening. I know this is long. I don't think it's as long as Paul's. <laughs> but, uh, you know, maybe. Maybe it is. I didn't check. Let's pray real quick, all right? Lord God Almighty, Creator of all, Redeemer, Healer, Messiah, You are everything. Lord, please judge. Please speak to hearts. Please fill their cups. Please show them what in all of this was Your voice. What in all of this was true and right. We love You, Lord. We praise Your holy name. If I have spoken your word, then don't let it return void. Let it accomplish the purposes for which it was spoken, according to your will and your good pleasure. I thank you for Brother Paul and what you're doing in him. And I thank you for his ministry. I thank you that we can reason together. That we can share what the different things that the Lord has given us. I know that my call is different than His. I know that my focus is different than His. I pray, Lord, that You would reconcile the dissonance. That we would allow it. That we would accept it. That we would understand it. And yet that we would always be seeking the higher truth, the deeper thing, the purer kernel at the heart of it all. I thank you, Lord, in advance for how this is touching people's hearts in one way or another and making them seek after you and making them hunger and thirst for truth and, and to study the word to show themselves approved. Give them wisdom that they would hear your voice so that they could walk in your ways. Please light the lampstands, Lord. Restore the body in all the cities where you're willing. That the bride would rise up pure and clean and shiny and pure. And that we would be one as you and the Father are one. We pray all of this to the Father in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Thanks for listening. More on fellowshipofthemartyrs.com.